you know, whenever I'm in Heidelberg, I'm thinking back to a kind of prophecy that was given once to me, because I was studying here in Heidelberg. I started to study in Heidelberg. Okay. And when I decided to study on in Berlin, and I told my professor, and he told me, you can do so, but then forget about your career, because Berlin was regarded as a very big place for women at that time. So was there also some kind of bad prophecy pandering upon you when you started to think about your career as a writer, to become a writer? Uh, this is a very interesting question. So um, when I wanted to write, and I think um, I told my father, he's a, he's a professor of Tamil, actually, and uh, he specializes in Sangam Tamil poetry, which is like 2,000 years old poetry. And uh, when I told him, yes, Dad, I want to become a writer, he told me, writer, a women writer, you know what women write to do? They leave their hair open and they sleep with everybody in town. Well, I managed both of that, but I also wrote. And uh, I think over time, my father's perception changed uh, because, uh, you know, like, he was so skeptical and he was like, this was the first thing he said. And the second thing he said was, you know, I'm not Tata, I'm not Drilla, you know, like, I'm not one of these rich or very powerful Indian men, so how are you even going to get published, you know? So it was so much about his own lack of self-confidence about mm -hmm. my career, like, there's no way I can help you, you know? But now I think when I write to my father, it's like, if he sees a single piece of paper that has some of my writing on it or in the newspaper, he records everything carefully, he's like very proud now. But yeah, it was very discouraging. And I also think this uh, discouraging about writer has something to do with the fact that uh, it's not easy to survive. Uh, once my dad said how he had to sell his blood in order to feed a friend of his who was a writer. So sometimes if you're a writer, you just don't have any income and it, you don't want that for your children, you know? Yes. Ich habe Mina gefragt, äh, ob auch am Anfang ihrer Karriere oder der Entscheidung, Schriftstellerin zu werden, so eine Art schlechte Prophezeiung in der Luft hing. Und sie hat geantwortet, ihr Vater ist Professor für Sanskrit äh, Poetry, also für Jahrtausende alte Gedichte. Und als, er, als sie ihm erzählt hat, dass sie Lyrikerin, Autorin werden möchte, sagte er ihr, du möchtest eine Women Writer, ja, eine Autorin werden. Weißt du, was das bedeutet? Der, Man geht davon aus, jede Frau, die als Autorin eine Autorin wird, wird eigentlich eine Autorin und wird mit jedem Mann schlafen. Inzwischen sagt sie, hat ihr Vater seine Sicht auf sie als Autorin und auf das Dasein als Autorin deutlich geändert. Ähm, ihr wurde aber klar, irgendwann hat er auch gesagt, ich bin nicht Tata. Tata ist einer der wirklich Großindustriellen, einer der reichsten Männer in Indien. Ich bin nicht jemand wie Tata. Und sie hat heute auch das Gefühl, diese Angst, dass seine Tochter Schriftstellerin wird, war auch pekuniären Sorgen geschuldet, da er sich eigentlich nicht vorstellen konnte, dass man davon leben kann. Und tatsächlich sagt sie, ist es auch sehr schwer. Dieser Vater musste offenbar auch einen Freund durchfüttern, der auch die Entscheidung irgendwann getroffen hatte, Autor zu werden. Mina Mrs. Militancy is, as a book title, is a very problematic title. In your poem, the reader finds rage and anger, but also fun and humor, tenderness and empathy. How would you describe the attitude out of which you're writing these poems? Uh, I think the title becomes uh, problematic only in the German translation because in English, if you say Miss Militancy, you'd, and especially if you spell it as MS, you don't give away whether it's a woman, I mean like a married woman, non-married woman, nothing is given away, you know. So Miss Militancy is actually empowering in the, in the English, but when it becomes a uh, Fraulein Militanz, I think it's, uh, every, I mean the first reaction is that, yeah, people frown like Fraulein, even now, like why do you have to use the title? But uh, I think there's a very specific reason why we decided to go with a slightly offensive title because the story that uh, the whole book is a collection of uh, feminist retellings of myths uh, which uh, I think um, Anne Sexton did in Transformations with the Grimm Brothers stories which uh, Carol Ann Duffy did in The World's Wife and Margaret Atwood has also done in a lot of her own poetry. So what I wanted to do was to you know follow in that tradition and take a lot of Hindu and Tamil myths and retell them. So one of the most popular Tamil epics is the epic of the Shila Padikaram, which runs around the story of Karnagi, of this one woman who goes and challenges the king because her husband is unjustly killed. And for me, this and uh, I think traditionally the story is seen about how her husband was cheating her, but she still loved him, so she's a devoted wife. But for me, that was not the story. The story is that 
even irrespective of what husband you were, she was going and fighting the state, you know, she was militant. So her marital status was, you know, just something that was not necessary for me. And I think what was important was the way she was going to, you know, like waging war as a one woman army. So that's why I, I chose the title, but also because uh, as Tamil women, we have a huge tradition of being female fighters, I think in, uh, maybe not in Tamil Nadu, but in Sri Lanka, which is across the border, and we have a lot of Tamil people who are very uh, sympathetic of the tigers when they used to exist. It's also that one third of the tigers were women, so for us to claim the space, the claim the right to be, you know, at the forefront to, to smash patriarchy through also being militants ourselves was very, very crucial and important. Happy that you have to have at some point. Um, sie sagt, der deutsche Titel Mrs. Militancy, eigentlich ist es der deutsche Titel, der ein bisschen äh, vielleicht auf eine falsche äh, Fährte führt. In, Im Englischen, also für die englischen, indischen äh, Leser, ist das eigentlich ein Titel, der eine Art Empowering, also eine Selbstermächtigung der Frauen ähm, hörbar macht. Ähm, sie sagt, was für diese Gedichtsammlung sehr entscheidend war, ist, dass sie hier halt eine Art feministische ja, Nacherzählung von äh, hinduistischen Mythen und Mythen aus dem äh, tamilischen ja, Folk ähm, liefern möchte. Ähm, sie verweist, äh, did I get it right, the wife of Shiva? Was that? Was it the wife of Shiva, who was the, the, um, the woman, what is the name of the woman you said? She went to search for him. No, this is not Shiva. This is a Tamil epic that's about an ordinary woman called Kannagi. This is what I meant. Yeah. Ich kenne es nicht persönlich, ähm, aber in dieser Geschichte sozusagen steht diese Geschichte, auf die sie zurückgreift, aus dem Tamilischen, steht eben dafür, dass äh, die Frau eigentlich auch zu einer Kriegerin wird. Und sie sagt, in, äh, in ihrer Heimat Tamil Nadu gibt es überhaupt eine sehr lange Tradition, dass Frauen das Recht für sich in Anspruch nehmen, Kriegerinnen zu sein. Viele Frauen kämpfen auch bei den Tamil Tigers, sind also wirklich auch an der vordersten Front, was äh, wirklich militärische Einsätze anbelangt. Und das ist etwas, was sie in diesen Geschichten noch mal zum Ausdruck bringen wollte, dieses patriarchische Modell, diese Vorstellung, Frauen müssen immer zu Hause sein, zu zerbrechen bzw. zu zeigen, in ihrer Kultur ist das eigentlich auch Normalität. These poems do speak to us in a very direct manner. The energy is uh, the gesture of oral speech. Mm -hmm. um, they are spiced with witty wordplays. They're spiced with political consciousness. They do touch issues that are still very sensible in India, such mm -hmm. as the gender politics and the caste system. Um, so I would say they are really a challenge to a normal Indian reader. Um, what are the reactions in India to these poems? Um. It's a very conservative society uh, yeah. and a very tolerant society. Both goes yeah. hand in hand in India. Yeah. Um, the thing is that uh, you said, you know, these poems are direct, there is wordplay. But I also think that uh, what you have diplomatically not said is these poems are very provocative. <laughs> and I, I deliberately write very provocative poems, you know. Because I think that um, one of the problems, at least uh, with not Indian but Tamil society, is that everything people will be silent, you know. There is going to be no, if we disapprove, we just ignore or we just be silent. So the big problem is to break the silence. And you just cannot break the silence by saying, okay, come, let us sit down and, you know, discuss this. That can happen in maybe Europe or, yeah, different society. But here people just ignore. So you have to, you know, like, it's basically calling someone, fight, come fight with me, you know. So, you cannot say you have to hit them in order for them to come and fight with you, you know. So, 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 and only if you fight, you have a chance to prove yourself. So, I think the poems are very provocative, very deliberately provocative. I'm never going to say, yeah, it's just freedom of expression. No, it's freedom to offend. So, yeah, it's one of the reasons why I, I write like that. So, very, very offensively, and to break the silence. But what happened is also, it. Uh, I think uh, when you write like this. Uh, I'm not sure you change society, but you can show what is the fault line in the society, what the society will take, and where the hypocrisy will come out. So when I wrote this Gandhi poem, and it was uh, translated in Malayalam, you know, the language in Kerala, uh, the BJP was burning my book. The Congress was also burning my book. Normally, these parties hate each other. 
but you know for this one poem they got together and the Congress chief who is now the Home Minister in Kerala uh, this guy called Ram, uh, Ramesh Chenitala he said she should not enter Kerala you know like is that it's that kind of you know level to which people go but also I have been on panels in which uh, there are male uh, moderators who say there is so much violence in your poems why is there violence I mean like but the thing is there is so much violence around us violence on our bodies but yeah that doesn't irritate men and then well, this guy was like why is your imagery why do you hate men and then I was trying to answer about you know body politics and why it's important for women to write all these words you know these bad words you know, but still, and then this guy said, but what is your problem with the dick? And this is exactly, this is what he said, you know. And, but, and this, is, this is the kind of, you know, sometimes the literary reception that you get, you know, a very published poet in an in a international festival can say, well, what is your problem with the dick? I don't know, I have to consult you later, but, you know, this is what happens. Gefragt, wie die ähm, Reaktionen auf ihre Gedichte in Indien ausfallen. Ein Land, das einerseits sehr tolerant ist, finde ich, aber auch sehr konservativ zur gleichen Zeit. Sagt sie, ähm, ich hätte vieles gesagt über ihre Gedichte, aber dezent verschrieben, dass sie äußerst provokativ sind, provokant. Und sie sagt, das Problem äh, vor allem mit der tamilischen Gesellschaft ist, dass über alles ein Schweigen gelegt wird. Es gibt viele Dinge, die nicht ausgesprochen und angesprochen werden dürfen. Und um dieses Schweigen zu brechen, muss man eigentlich sozusagen einen Schlag austeilen, damit die Person wirklich endlich mal zu einer Reaktion verursacht oder veranlasst wird. Und sie hat weiter gesagt, für sie ist nicht wichtig die, die Redefreiheit, sondern die Freiheit zu ja, Freedom of Offense, zu verletzen eigentlich. Ähm, ihr geht es nicht darum, die Gesellschaft zu ändern, aber ihr geht es darum, die Bruchstellen aufzuzeigen, das niederzuschreiben, was falsch läuft in der indischen Gesellschaft. Ähm, andere Reaktionen sind, das ist ihr Geschehen vor einigen Jahren, dass sowohl die BGP, also die Hindu-Nationalisten, die momentan an der Macht sind unter Narendra Modi, als auch der Kongress, sich dann endlich einmal äh, einig waren und beschlossen haben, diese Person muss mit einem Bann belegt werden, sie sollte unter anderem dann auch nicht mehr in Kerala einreisen dürfen. Und sie hat auch erlebt, dass sie auf Panels war und männliche Moderatoren sie dann immer fragen, wieso ist da immer so diese furchtbare Gewalt in ihren Gedichten und warum hassen sie überhaupt Männer und was ist ihr Problem mit dem männlichen Geschlecht? Ja, auch sehr diplomatisch. <lacht> You said that business militancy is a kind of feminist uh, retelling mm -hmm. of um, Hindu and Tamil myth. So mm -hmm. it refers to Hindu and Dalit uh, deities, to Su Sufi saints uh, at, at some parts also. Um, but what these women are going through in some parts is also still very actual. Mm -hmm. it, you can read it, you know, as a poem about the present also. Um, seeing from Western view, the situation of women in India might be only catastrophic. <coughs> what is the view from within India as an Indian woman? What makes you play Mrs. Militancy in your poem? Uh, what makes me? What makes you play out Mrs. Militancy oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in your poem? Um, uh, see the, the, the question of using myth is uh, like um, is how do you smuggle something that's uh, dangerous or so, so smuggle something that's prohibited. So, you know, like, um, if you're going to talk about just sex, people are going to be like, ah, oh, but, you know, she's the dirty person. So you should say, well, I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about something, you know, very well. You know the Sita story in the Ramayana? I'm trying to say what was happening between Ravana and Sita, you know, that's the context in which I took sex. So I'm always going to some framework which is very religious or very holy or very mythical for you, which you de never tell anybody not to talk about. And from there I'm trying to go and give a reinterpretation about the silences. So I think myths are, because they are very universal stories, so you can try to, you know, talk about them and, you know, use them. For instance, the story of Sita is um, always read as, you know, this very chaste wife. She's the central character of the Ramayana, the one who's very devoted to her husband. 
but also she is the first woman who steps across the line you know the brother-in-law draws a line and tells her not to step across or meet any stranger but she talks to stranger she steps across the line so there are two readings possibly either you read it as a devoted wife or you read this as the woman who you know talks to strangers steps across the line so how do you what what's which is the women you want so and you can never tell oh we we should have be free women you know because then people are going to be like you know what happens to people like you so we are like well you know this woman called sita whom you respect so much well she was like that so in a sense getting these people and putting them in a different light is a, is a kind of you know uh, underground uh, gorilla strategy and the second thing is um, uh, how is it about an indian woman i think sometimes uh, even myself i often feel that uh, if you're an Indian, you know, there's a, or an Indian woman, especially in the Western public, there's a certain story that they want to play up, and uh, I'm completely aware of that, uh, because uh, when I when I wrote this book, which is a political novel about um, a communist or a socialist, with, you know, workers asking for higher wages, workers fighting against untouchability. Um, you know, and I'm writing another book which slightly deals with domestic violence and my publisher said, oh, you should have published the one about domestic violence first because that is more marketable here. You know, like Indian woman gets beaten up, very marketable. But much as I know that the Western or white male gaze is uh, trained in a particular way, it does not in any way take away from the horrors of what is happening in India. Because just because people are looking in a certain way, it does, does not mean that something else is happening there. And these are two very different distinctions. Like uh, two days ago, the High Court of Madras, a judge ruled that the rapist should meet his victim uh, and um, they should both sit and talk and uh, he should actually marry her and they could, should come to reconciliation and he says that's because now she's an unwed mother as the result of a rape that happened when she was 15 as a society we should take responsibility and so this man must meet the woman he raped and you know like it's it, it doesn't call about the woman's agency about what she feels about it doesn't talk about punishment but this is the solution that the court gives and then the State Women's Commission, I'm not making any of this up, the State Women's Commission says, yes, this is the right approach because we are a society where, you know, children have to be protected and so for the sake of children, people should put behind their, they should compromise and come to a solution. So you have a court that basically is legitimizing rape, that is, you know, trying to broker a deal between, you know, the person who does a rape and the one who is raped. So when things are happening like this, I don't think that um, there is uh, overemphasis or what is uh, shown in the West is uh, any different because of course this is happening very much on the ground. So I think that's my, that's my opinion. And as far as uh, my own poetry is, is concerned, I think uh, anybody else in my situation who is writing poetry would uh, do something very similar because I think it's, uh, it's, the, it's a certain time which we are living through. So we are all product of our time and uh, what we write is only a response to what is going on around us. Sie sagt, um, die, der Rückbezug auf die Mythen ist insofern eine Art Schmuggel, den sie praktizieren muss. Denn wenn sie in direkter Weise zum Beispiel über weibliche Sexualität sprechen würde, wäre das verboten und ihre Gedichte vielleicht sie als Person würde als schmutzig dastehen. In dem Moment, wo man dem aber eine Art religiösen oder mythischen Rahmen verleiht, ist es für sie leichter, diese Gedichte an die Frau und an den Mann zu bringen. Zum Beispiel, wenn sie Sita als Figur nimmt, Sita ist eigentlich eine der wichtigsten ja, Bezugspersonen für äh, indische Frauen, Sita, deren äh, man sie verlässt, durch die Feuerprobe gehen muss und die immer dargestellt wird als keusch und als treu, also der Inbegriff dessen, wie jede indische Frau eigentlich zu sein hat. Sie sagt aber, ähm, es gibt zwei Arten, zwei Lesarten, zum Beispiel dieser Figur von Sita eben, eine wäre die devote, keusche, treue Frau, die andere wäre die Frau, 
die eigentlich als erste in der indischen oder hinduistischen Mythologie über die Grenze getreten ist, die das getan hat, was ihr verboten worden ist. Und äh, ihre Nacherzählungen sind insofern eigentlich auch so eine Art feministische Gegenlektüre zu dem offiziellen Bild von diesen Figuren, wie zum Beispiel Sita. Und wenn sie zum Beispiel über Sita schreibt, um über etwas ganz anderes zu schreiben, dann ist das eine Art underground guerilla strategie um eben das hineinzuschmuggeln, was sie in direkter Weise nicht ausdrücken könnte. Sie hat 2014 Gypsy Goddess geschrieben, die Geschichte eines Aufstandes, einer Politisierung. Diesen Roman spricht eine Erzählerin, die in das Dorf reist und die Geschichte recherchiert und aufschreibt. Es gibt viele kämpfende Frauen, es gibt Kommunistinnen in diesem Roman. Gleichzeitig saß sie, erzählt sie an einem Roman über häusliche Gewalt und die Reaktionen waren, dass sie teilweise zu hören bekam, ab veröffentlicht doch lieber mal bitte ähm, den Roman über Domestic Violence, also häusliche Gewalt. Und das ist im Westen leichter vermarktbar. Das heißt, sie sagt, einerseits gibt es dieses Bild im Westen, dass die Situation der Frauen in Indien nur katastrophal ist, dass sie nur unterdrückt ist, nur ausgebeutet ist, dass sie nichts zu sagen hat. Ähm, und sie weiß darum, dass das sehr schwierig ist, dagegen anzugehen. Und dieses Klischee, ist aber, es ist ein Klischee, wie sie sagt, natürlich gibt es tatsächlich auch viele dieser Dinge, das sagt sie, muss man immer als zwei, Dinge, als zwei Sachen auseinanderhalten. Sie hat erzählt, der High Court in Madras hat gerade eben ein Gesetz verabschiedet, das besagt, dass Vergewaltiger nun ihr Opfer treffen sollen oder dass Vergewaltigungsopfer ihren Vergewaltiger treffen sollten, damit man heiratet und selbst die ich weiß die Übersetzung nicht korrekt, State Women Commission, also die Kommission einer Kommission für Frauen, hat dieses Gesetz für gut befunden, weil gesagt wird, das ist um das Kindeswohl das Beste. Das heißt, das Wichtigste ist, dass die Fassade, dass der Schein gewahrt wird. Und sie sagt, solange solche Dinge geschehen in Indien, wie soll man da sozusagen den Westen seinen teilweise sehr klischeehaften Blick auf Indien auch vorwerfen? In uh, the collection of Touch, you're writing a lot about the situation of the lower caste. Mm -hmm. the untouchable and also the injustice of the caste system itself. Now, by Indian constitution, the caste system is forbidden, mm -hmm. which is the paper, okay. uh, so one could say it's part of the past. Also in the recent years, one could say there was a lot of speaking up of minorities, also of Dalits. Um, there was a growing segment of Dalit literature, there are quotes reserved for the Dalits, so, if I could play the devil's advocate, I would say, what is the point in still fighting for the rights of the Dalits? Um, uh, this is also... There are many myths about India, you know. The myth that yoga cures everything is one big myth. Uh, there are, uh, there's a myth that uh, we apparently were doing space travel 5,000 years ago. That's another myth. There's a myth that uh, we had cure for AIDS and cancer and we had a surgery like even before humans walked on this earth, but we managed a lot of time traveling tricks. And one such myth is that the caste system is abolished. <laughs> so, and this is very widespread because I, I got the same question on another interview and it somehow says it's banned, but the caste system is never banned. What we have to understand is the practice of untouchability is forbidden which we know is that if it's forbidden as untouchability, it's going to come in other forms, you know. So, and the, the, the law to prosecute uh, people who practice untouchability actually lists out 64 methods in which untouchability might be practiced. By calling your caste name, by using a separate tumbler for the untouchable in the restaurant, uh, by asking you to do a job like sweeping or cleaning the toilet because it's uh, related to certain caste, uh, by you know like a systematic economic exclusion, ostracization, refusing to allow you to you know let a house. So th the state itself can enumerate at least 64 instances of you know penalizing people for practicing untouchability, which should tell you about how ingenious the system. For instance, um, Dalit men are not allowed to sometimes, uh, you know, uh, ride a bike through upper caste or caste Hindu street. They should get down and walk. And if they walk, sometimes they should not walk with slippers on their feet. They should walk barefoot because, you know, so, so there is a lot of, um, and there is also, uh, you know, sections of politicians who are trying to 
uh, further abuse Dalit people by even getting away this this was basically called the Protection of Civil Rights Act. It later became the Prevention of Atrocities Against the Dalits Act. So they're even trying to get this law script so that they have given a free for all, you know. There is no law even to call them into question. So, so on the one hand, we have Dalit literature, which uh, again, which I should say is, is brilliant. There's a lot of brilliant stuff getting written, but what gets translated, what gets published is another question because uh, the gatekeepers of literature have ensured that Dalit literature become, remains a literature of misery, a literature that you read in order to feel compassion, a literature that you read in order to feel better about yourself, you know, so that you feel compassionate, you feel, uh, you know, empathy, empathy so you feel like oh I'm a nice person because I feel for all these poor suffering people whereas the Dalit literature which is extremely militant the Dalit literature which is extremely political the Dalit literature which talks about things like Palestine and Kashmir and nationalism that literature doesn't get translated the literature is the, the literature that's most powerful the literature that's you know uh, making everyday change the literature that the people speak that doesn't get translated or published by these international houses so whom they choose is, is a huge politics whom they choose is also a certain kind of story that uh, the narrative that gets chosen so yeah that's one thing but uh, why as uh, claudia asked me the provocatively and I think the, the, the issue about untouchability or the issue about caste system is an issue about for every one of us in India because I think the caste system is sustained by the fact that women are controlled. Women are told whom they should marry in order that the caste system is preserved. So on one hand it is a problem of the caste but it's also a problem for 50% of India's population because any woman lacks complete sexual autonomy because she is told you're supposed to marry somebody from this caste and not from any other, not from anything lower. And the punishment is, uh, comes in the form of honor killings or threats. Like in October 2012 in the village of Dharmapuri there was a girl called Divya who fell in love with a Dalit boy called Ilavarasan and they both eloped. But the punishment was that Ilavarasan's village and two other villages were burnt, like really charred too. 300 homes were burnt in a single afternoon. The police just stepped away, they looked at it. And this, these 300 homes of Dalit people were burnt to teach a lesson that you don't touch our girls, you know what I mean? Just to teach a lesson to the girls, you don't do what you want to do, you follow what your elders say. And I think when, when it becomes so, uh, when it becomes so, spectacularly bad I think people should sit up and you know ask questions and especially you know I think it's a very much a feminist issue the question of caste at least for me it is sorry long long answer <laughs> Ich habe sie provokant gefragt, warum es eigentlich immer noch nötig wäre, über das Kastensystem zu schreiben. Es wäre eigentlich abgeschafft, verboten. Es gibt Quoten für die unteren Kasten. Es gibt ein wachsendes Segment an Literatur in den letzten Jahren etc. pp. Und sie sagte, ihre Antwort lautete, es gibt eine Menge Mythen über Indien, unter anderem, dass man schon vor mehreren tausend Jahren ein Heim mit Fikret erfunden hätte. Und ein Mythos, Mythos sei eben auch, dass das Kassensystem abgeschafft und verboten wäre. Sie sagt, das stimmt nicht, sondern ähm, die, Praxis, die, die Praxis des Unbe Unberührbarkeit die ist verboten. Tatsächlich aber, sagt sie, kommt das Kastensystem in anderer und vielleicht sogar in viel genialerer Form zurück. Wenn ich es richtig noch im Kopf habe, sagte sie, gibt es 74 Arten, die nicht berührbar oder das, das unberührbar sein zu praktizieren. Das eine läuft über, sie hat mehrere Beispiele genannt, ökonomische Exklusion. Da Männer dürfen teilweise auf gewissen Straßen nur Barsfuß laufen, müssen ihre Schuhe ausziehen etc. pp. Und was die wachsende, das wachsende Segment der Literatur anbelangt, sagt sie, ja, das stimmt. Es gibt ein wachsendes Segment und das ist erfreulich, aber man muss genau hinschauen und die Frage stellen, was davon wird übersetzt und gelangt dann in den Westen. Und sie sagt, tatsächlich gibt es diese Gatekeeper, also die Torhüter in den großen entscheidenden Verlagen und das, was übersetzt wird, bedient immer nur das ewig gleiche Narrativ und das ist ein Narrativ des einzigen Elends. Die wichtigen Titel, sagt sie, die wirklich entscheidend sind, sind Titel, die sehr militant sind, sehr politisch, sehr politisiert sind, die auch über Kaschmir oder Palästina sprechen, die, sagt sie, werden nicht übersetzt. Das Letzte, was sie sagte, ist, dass die Frage des Kassensystems eigentlich alle angeht, denn 
das Kastensystem betrifft auch das Thema der Heirat und wird insofern auch über das Vehikel der Frau weitergereicht. Das heißt, wen eine Frau heiratet, wird stark kontrolliert durch die Frage der Kassen und der Kassenzugehörigkeit. Und wenn eine Frau in die falsche Kaste heiratet oder sich in einen Mann der falschen Kaste verliebt, wird das extrem hart bestraft. Sie hat von einem Beispiel erzählt, in dem es eben eine verbotene Liebe gab ähm, zwischen einem Dalit-Mädchen und einem Kassenangehörigen, die sie nicht lieben durfte, sie sind durchgebrannt und zur Strafe wurden zwei Dörfer niedergebrannt, 300 Häuser wurden niedergebrannt unter den Augen der Polizei, um eine Lektion zu erteilen, dass das Kastensystem eben doch sehr wohl äh, zu verfolgen sei. Das heißt, das Kastensystem ist ein gesamtgesellschaftliches Problem, aber nicht zuletzt für sie auch ein feministisches Problem oder eine feministische Angelegenheit. Um, some years ago, I know a case was filed against you. I, I was told about that by Art of Taiwan when I was in Bombay 2006. Um, obviously, you had given a garland that was meant for a Hindu deity to a figure that is what I read about. I think it's in Gypsy Goddess also. Mm -hmm. So, um, Art of, when he was in Berlin, he told me, I can't write in India. I have this censor completely always in my head. It's there. Mm -hmm. How do you handle the question of censorship? The inner censorship also? Um, I don't know if I have an internal censor because you saw what I read. If I have a censor and this is what I write, imagine what I will write without the censor. So. <laughs> So I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I work on the sensor, but I also think that um, sometimes this uh, this question is about. Um, uh, I, I'm very curious because uh, when people file cases against me, which they actually did file, uh, and the claim was India actually has 33 million guards, right? And so I was, uh, as I said, I translated Dalit literature. I translated. Uh, the speeches of a Dalit political leader into English because I think that, uh, you know, I'm also a translator from the Tamil and I think that all these sad stories is one thing, but if there is a political party that has brought militancy, that is organized at least, um, um, you know, 10 million people to vote for them or to work for them and, uh, you know, to feel proud about themselves and to, you know, challenge caste head on. I think it's a big phenomena and, you know, you have to go and see what are, what I what are the leaders talking, what are they writing. So I was, you know, I think this is literature as much as a poem is a literature or autobiography is a literature. So I was translating these speeches. And in one of these speeches, what um, he makes the point, um, the leader's name is uh, Tol Tirma Valavan. So he makes this point about, um, how all the deities of the Dalits were appropriated into the Hindu fold and uh, when I gave a footnote I m managed to mention sh two deities and uh, which is claimed by let's say a slightly uh, an upper, upper or intermediary caste so this caste people filed a case against me and said against me against the writer and the publisher and said so you have changed the caste of this uh, of these gods, so you know, we want to. You have insulted our community. You have tried to incite a riot, and they filed this case seven years after the book was published, and that's the beautiful thing. Because for seven years there was no rioting, for seven years there was no problem. You know, if my book was really going to cause that trouble because of a small footnote, it would have caused a lot of trouble in seven years. But then they filed this case, and I think the the legal mechanism can be used to punish somebody in an extremely bad or penalizing way. And that's how it's, uh, it's, it's slightly used because once I tweeted about beef eating in a, in a festival and I got all these threats and one of the things they also said was file a case against her in every city because then she will be forced to travel because if you don't attend court hearings three times you're declared an absconder so it doesn't matter where in India somebody files a case against you for offending the sentiment you have to go and present yourself in court. And this is just waste her time, you know, like file a case everywhere. So I think the legal machinery is something that, yeah, people do use to, to silence you. And uh, at the same time, I'm quite looking forward to ending up in jail by the end of this uh, Modi's term because I think I get a writer in residency there. You know, jail time, free time to write. I don't have to do events. 
I, I get food regularly, so I'm, I'm actually quite, I, I can also, yeah, write about prison conditions and, you know, like, so I'm quite looking forward to it. I'm, they're not yet thrown me in jail, but yeah, soon I will be there, then you can send me postcards. Yeah, I want to go to jail, I'm not shy about that. Auf meine Frage, wie sie mit der drohenden Zensur umgeht, denn es wurden, ähm, es wurden Anklagen gegen sie schon losgelöst. Man muss wissen, in Indien ist das extrem einfach, äh, einen Schriftsteller zu denunzieren, indem man einen sogenannten Fall, es gibt, man geht zu einem Hort, es gibt ein bestimmtes Gesetz, man geht einfach zu einem Gericht und sagt, ich möchte gerne äh, dagegen klagen und dann hat der Autor, die Autorin schon ein, ein Riesenproblem an. Also muss ich diesen Problem auch stellen, also er kann nicht sagen, ich erziehe mich dem oder ich ignoriere das, ähm, den Fall, den ich, auf den ich angespielt habe, weswegen damals äh, eine Klage gegen sie äh, in Gang kam. Sie sagt, es gibt 33 Millionen Götter im Hinduismus und sie hatte ein Buch übersetzt mit den Reden eines äh, Dalit-Führers, das hat sie aus dem Tamilischen ins Englische übersetzt und äh, unter anderem ähm, in, dieser, in einer dieser Reden erklärt dieser Dalit-Führer, wie diverse hinduistische Gottheiten in das System der Dalit-Gottheiten angepasst worden sind. Und sieben Jahre, das ist vielleicht der entscheidende Punkt, sagt sie, sieben Jahre nach der Veröffentlichung dieses Buches kommt dann jemand daher und sagt, das geht aber nicht, sie haben hier verbotenerweise die Kaste geändert und sie wurde angeklagt. Sie sagt, man muss einfach offen darüber sich im Klaren sein, das ist ein sehr geschicktes System, Autoren und Autorinnen zu bestrafen und eben eine Maschinerie, die anläuft, damit man sich eben auch schwer entziehen kann. Sie hatte unter anderem über ähm, den Verzehr von ähm, Rinderfleisch getwittert und sofort gab es eine Art Kettenreaktion, wo jemand, der sich in seinen religiösen Gefühlen äh, darum gestört hat, dann twitterte, ähm, dass man quasi also in jeder Stadt gegen sie jetzt eine Klage in Gang setzen sollte, denn das würde bedeuten, dass sie von Stadt zu Stadt reisen muss, um vor Ort sich zu verteidigen und es wäre eine sehr effektive Methode, sie von ihrem eigentlichen Methoden schreiben abzuholen, abzuhalten. 1997, 13 years old, mm -hmm. the novel was published, written by a woman writer, and I think it was one of the most, uh, one of the first Indian novels having great global success, and it's also about forbidden love between a lower caste and a higher caste people. It's mm -hmm. Alindhati Roy's The Goddess yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah. Um, What did she mean to you? What did this novel mean to you as a writer? Um, I think uh, there are at least uh, two women writers to whom I owe a lot about why I'm a writer. Uh, women Indian writers, I mean. And for the first, I think, is Kamala Das, mm -hmm. uh, who I used to read as a teenager mm -hmm. because, yeah, I used to borrow books of poetry from the library. And she was like, she just opened my mind and um, whatever I knew about my body, I learned something else from her. So yeah, I became a different person after Kamala Das. But more than Kamala Das, I think um, as much as her, at least, um, I must have been like 16 or 15. And we had this copy of The God of Small Things in our library. And uh, we used to be like six girls who were studying yeah, science um, in the final year of school, uh, pre-final year of school. And, um, you know, like when we had this games period, we would sit and read this book aloud because it was so poetic and it was so lovely. And so, you know, the fact is it was, su it was such a beautiful language and it was like, you're 16 and you think somebody can do this with language, you know. And I still think, yeah, there are lines about <laughs> the book I can, you know, uh, just say like that's like, uh, biology designed the dance. Terror timed it, or uh, something like uh, they loved by night, uh, they loved by day the man the mother loved by night, or you know, like hundreds of things. So, yeah, it's a book that uh, it just stays in your memory, and even if you just read it once or twice. So, I think it was a beautiful book. But uh, what, uh, what I think Arundhati means to me is beyond the book of Rice, beyond the book itself, beyond the beauty of what she writes, because. She won this prize and she could have been n number of things, but she decided to, you know, take on... She was fighting against the Narmada Dam, she was exposing the problem of big dams, she was fighting against India's nuclearization program, 
She's consistently stood for the rights of the oppressed people. She's consistently used her celebrity, used the, the global reach that she has to highlight what's wrong with India, to, uh, you know, to pick on all these problems. She has, uh, you know, said what's wrong, what's the, what's the silent, uh, you know, kind of uh, structural problem of, you know, selling lands to the big corporations and she's exposed that. So she's exposed capitalism's ugly face. So I think that she's incredibly brave and uh, somebody whom I really love and admire. And uh, I also have had the good fortune of meeting her and yeah, we have a quite, uh, I love her very much and I think she knows that I love her, but yeah. So it's, it's, it's really nice that, you know, someone like her exists because uh, otherwise it's just, you know, the singular narrative of which she challenges and breaks it down and she does that fearlessly, courageously. Yeah, we have to salute her for that. <laughs> Gefragt nach dem, was der Roman äh, Der Gott der kleinen Dinge für Sie bedeutet hat, der 1997 erschien und ja auch vielleicht zum ersten Mal zumindest in diesem, mit diesem großen weltweiten internationalen Erfolg eine verbotene Liebe beschreibt zwischen einem höherrangigen Kastenangehörigen und einem niederrangigen Kastenangehörigen. Ähm, was dieses Buch für Sie bedeutet, sie war 13 Jahre als äh, der Roman erschien, sagt sie ja. Also sie ist auf alle Fälle eine sehr wichtige Person gewesen. Es gab auch noch Tamara Das, auch eine Autorin, deren Gedichte sie stark beeinflusst haben. Aber sie war 15 Jahre alt. Es waren insgesamt sechs, fünf, fünf bis sechs Mädchen, die zusammen saßen in der Bibliothek und sich gegenseitig laut aus der, dem Gott der kleinen Dinge vorgelesen haben. Die Sprache, sagt sie, die Schönheit dieser Sprache, die betört sie noch heute. Sie haben gehört, sie kann das aus dem Stand zitieren. Was sie aber fast noch mehr bewundert, ist nicht die Tatsache, dass es diesen Roman gibt, dass es diese Autoren gibt und dass sie all diese wichtigen Preise dafür gewonnen hat, sondern dass Arundhati Roy beschlossen hat, zu kämpfen, weiterzukämpfen, sich einzusetzen für die Unterdrückten. Gegen den Staudamm, Namada ist der Namada Staudamm, gegen den Namada Staudamm zu kämpfen gegen die Atomkraft oder die Atomisierung, die Atomkraft, die in Indien ja ganz wichtig ist, anzugehen. Sie hat immer wieder ihre Aufmerksamkeit, diese globale, hat dafür eingesetzt, um auf die ja, Missstände in Indien hinzuweisen, auf die Big Corporations, die Macht der Großindustriellen, die den Kapitalismus, der um sich greift in Indien. Das ist etwas, was sie sagt, das ist etwas, was sie bis heute sehr beeindruckt und eigentlich auch beflügelt. Nina kann das haben. Danke. Danke.